Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for coming here. So today we ha uh, have a very, very special uh, guest, a very special lecturer, that will t uh, Professor Randall Hewlett, that will talk about a very hot topic in cold uh, physics, in ultra-cold physics. Uh, since this event uh, has been 100% organized by the student of the chapter of the Optical Society of America, I will let Eduardo Ibarra, who's the president of this association, to do the proper presentation of our lecturer. Thank you. Hello, well, first, uh, thanks to everybody to be here. And I'm gonna give a brief presentation of Professor Hewlett. So, Randall Hewlett earned a bachelor's degree from Stanford University in 1978 and a PhD in physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1984. He was a National Research Council Fellow at NIST, Boulder, where he worked on laser cooling of trapped atomic ions. He joined the faculty of Rice University in 1987, where he currently holds the Fayez Sarofim Chair in Natural Science. Professor Hewlett's work is now focused on many body physics with ultra-cold atoms, including studies of Bose-Einstein condensation, matter wave solidons, the Beck BCS crossover and pairing in imbalanced Fermi gases, and quantum magnetism. His awards include the I.I. Rabbi Prize for the, of the American Physical Society, the National Science Foundation Presidential Young in Investigators Award, a NASA Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement, and the Willis Elam Medal for Laser Science and Quantum Optics. He has also received an honorary doctorate from Utrecht University. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancements, Advancements of Science and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. Randall Hewlett and his colleagues contribute to the early development of the physics of ultra-cold atoms, particularly with the isotopes of lithium. So let's give a, a huge applause for our, for our speaker. Well, thank you very much, Eduardo. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is not my first time to Mexico City, but it is my first time to UNAM, and it's uh, really um, an amazing place. I don't think I've ever been to a university of this scale before. It's really, uh, and it's beautiful, a beautiful campus. And it's a real pleasure to be here. So one of the reasons why I'm here is that I would like to talk to you about Rice University, tell you a few things about Rice University in Houston especially to any students who might be thinking about going abroad for uh, graduate programs. Um, we have a very uh, strong graduate program in physics at Rice. This is a, a picture of the campus. This is the old part of the campus. This is the old physics building over here on the left. It's uh, long ago, uh, we didn't do any physics in it, uh, experimental, <laughs> uh, because its uh, facilities weren't adequate. But we have a brand new physics building and uh, we're in that. Um, this building was 100 years old. Uh, the campus is also beautiful at Rice. It's not nearly as big as yours, but it's very sparse. We only have 7,000 students, and I'm told that you have well over 100,000 students here. So it's a real contrast um, in scale. Um, but we have a very strong physics department. We have about 40 faculty members in physics, and uh, we have several areas of strength. Um, one of them, of course, is cold atom physics that I will mention first. Uh, we do, uh, five of us do cold atom physics at Rice. Uh, we also have a, a good program in condensed matter, both theory and experiment, um, and also in astronomy and uh, in atmospheric physics and observational astronomy and particle physics. So we have a pretty well-rounded physics department if you're interested in applying to a PhD program in physics, I hope that you will consider Rice. Okay, so that's, that's my plug. So uh, I'm gonna talk about, as Eduardo mentioned, quantum magnetism with ultra-cold atoms. Uh, this was work that was done by uh, experimental group in blue, uh, Pedro Duarte, uh, who happens to be Colombian um, and is uh, now working in uh, Silicon Valley. Russell Hart, Ernie Young, Xin Zing Liu, Melissa Ravel, and Ben Olson. And we had a great collaboration, we still do have a great collaboration with uh, this group of theorists. And as you'll see as I, during my talk, the theorists played a very important role. 
you know, we're almost, as experimentalists, we're almost outnumbered by them. Uh, well, not quite, but almost. Um, and there's a good reason for that, um, because they uh, were really, uh, were instrumental in making this project work. All right, so this is an outline of my talk. I'll give an introduction, a brief introduction to quantum gases. I know um, you have work here uh, in ultra-cold atomic physics, um, and so I won't uh, dwell on some of the introductory things, but I will uh, talk about um, the general generalities, I guess. Uh, the BEC-BCS crossover, uh, and then I'd like to finish with antiferromagnetism in an optical lattice. All right, so let's begin with introduction to quantum gases. So um, imagine you have a box and you fill it with atoms and the atoms are all identical. So they're all lithium-7 or they're all lithium-6, they're all rubidium-85 or what have you. Uh, and you cool them down such that their de Broglie wavelengths begin to overlap. And this mathematically, this is the condition for that, that n times the density times the de Broglie wavelength cubed is of order one or bigger. Um, and these are kind of characteristic density and temperature scales that we need. So we're talking here about nano Kelvin kinds of temperatures. And that means the de Broglie wavelength is of order of micron. So we're getting, you know, on the order of a, of a wavelength of light. So de Broglie wavelengths that are, you know, getting to be macroscopic. So under those conditions, you can see phase transitions. In the case of bosons, if these identical particles obey Bose-Einstein statistics, uh, you can see Bose-Einstein condensation of phase transition. Uh, if they obey fermionic statistics, um, you can, under proper situation that I'll describe, uh, be able to see a transition to a superfluid um, with fermions. And so in our lab, as also in Professor Simon's lab here at your university, um, works with lithium. We work with lithium-7, which is a boson, and lithium-6, which is a, a composite fermion. So this is a thermometer, but it's a very special kind of thermometer. It's a decade thermometer, so this is a log scale here. Going from room temperature at 300 degrees Kelvin down to a few nanokelvin. And you can see every decade that something new has happened uh, in the world of physics as people developed new methods for achieving ever lower temperatures. So this is room temperature here. Air liquefies at about 77 degrees Kelvin. This is where the cosmological background, um, background temperature, the cosmic background radiation is a couple of degrees. Um, this also happens to be where helium liquefies. And that achievement, liquefying helium, led to the discovery of superconductivity in 1911 by Kamerling Onis. Um, that's the standard quantum limit. That's if you pump on liquid helium, you can get down to a few tens of millikelvin. If you go even colder and you work very hard, you use a dilution refrigerator, you can get colder. You get down to a few millikelvin, which led to the discovery of superfluid liquid helium-3. So helium-3 is a composite Fermi gas, whereas helium-4 is a composite Bose gas. So um, laser cooling, the recoil limit, is really as far as we can get with laser cooling. It's on the order of a few microkelvin. You go even further to this quantum regime that I talked about on the previous slide, and you can start to see these things like Bose-Einstein condensation. So you can see how many decades of lowering temperature that are required, and each of these requires a different kind of technology, a different kind of refrigerator, uh, and reveals ever new physics. So we don't know what's going to happen when we go lower, um, right now, we're kind of at the tens of nanokelvin regime. And there are some very interesting things that I'll mention in a few minutes that one might observe uh, at temperatures even lower than this. All right, so I've talked a little bit about bosons and fermions in the last few slides. What makes lithium-7 a composite boson? Well, it's composed of an even number of spin-a-half particles. In the case of lithium-7, 10. 
And so that means it's an integer spin particle and therefore a boson. Lithium-6, on the other hand, has one fewer neutron and is therefore a composite fermion. And so it's this very small difference. They're chemically identical. This is always amazing to me. They're essentially chemically identical, um, but one's a boson and one's a fermion, and those differences, though, don't manifest until you get to very low temperatures. So at t equals zero, the bosons, they like each other. They can, be, they can occupy, occupy the same quantum state. So they all pile up in the ground state of the container they're in, whereas fermions don't. And the fermions have to obey the Pauli principle, which means only one of them per energy level, up to an energy that we call the Fermi energy. And so when you get to these kinds of low temperatures, you can see that there's a dramatic difference in the energetics, even, of fermions compared to bosons. Now, how does that manifest itself in um, some real experiments? Well, these are, these are bosons. These are some of the things that have been accomplished with bosons over the last you know, 20 years or so since the Bose-Einstein condensation was first made. Um, been 21 years now, I guess. And this list is really longer than I could put on this slide. There are many, many things that you could add to this that I have left off, but I've shown a few highlights. Um, these are um, vortices, an arrays of vortices that you take a Bose-Einstein condensate and you stir it, and it produces quantized uh, excitations, which are, which are these irrotational vortices. Um, this is in Emanuel Bloch's lab in Munich. This is a mod insulator phase transition. So this is in an optical lattice. I'll describe what that is in a few minutes. And this is in my lab, uh, I guess about 10 or 12 years ago now. These are uh, matter wave solitons. So a soliton is a non-dispersing wave packet. It's something that can propagate in one dimension, essentially indefinitely, without spreading and without changing shape and without diminishing in amplitude. And we, in fact, this is a one-dimensional waveguide. We watch these things oscillate back and forth in this 1D waveguide for time scales of seconds without any appreciable spreading. So this is really quantum mechanics at work on a, essentially a macroscopic scale. We're looking at this with a, with a microscope. The difference between one peak to the next is about 10 microns. All right, well, fermions are maybe perhaps even more interesting um, because they connect various areas of physics, including condensed matter physics, um, nuclear physics, and even quark matter are composed of fermions. And so it's possible to make connections to these other areas of physics, but in completely different energy and length scales. So uh, some of the things that I'll, that, I, that I'll mention are quantum magnetism, and I'll talk about that. Um, exotic forms of superconductivity, I don't think I'll have time to talk about that, but that's something that we've been working on. Uh, strongly interacting 1D systems, quantum criticality, disordered insulators, topological matter, and again, the, or, the list goes on and on and on. And I, you know, I, 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 it, it's really uh, been stunning, the developments, I think, both theoretical and experimental over the last 10 or 20 years in the case of these degenerate Fermi gases. The reason why they hold so much promise and they've been so valuable to us in understanding many body physics is given over here on the left. These are all the parameters that you can tune that I can think of, and there are probably more. But important things like interactions are completely tunable by something called a Feshbach resonance. Um, lattice parameters, uh, temperature, density, dimensionality, various different kinds of lattices, different kinds of geometries that you can imagine and can construct, triangular lattices, Kagame lattices. You can spin polarize a system, which is like magnetizing a superconductor. Um, you can impose spin-orbit interactions. Um, you can even impose disorder. So you take these beautifully clean systems and you essentially throw dirt on these clean systems. And the dirt is in the form of, of, of disorder, uh, just some kind of a disordered potential, random potential. 
And that um, reveals new kinds of phase transitions and new phases of matter. And one of the big tools that we have at our disposal are optical lattices. An optical lattice is nothing but a standing wave. So if I take a beam of light, a laser beam, single frequency, and I reflect it back on itself, it'll form a standing wave. And that standing wave is a periodic potential for the atoms. As the atoms move across the standing wave, they see a potential which oscillates up and down. And so you can imagine putting these, these standing waves in one dimension, and if it's tight enough, you can confine the atoms in the nodes of, these, uh, of the standing wave, and you make an array of essentially disconnected uh, pancakes, which allows you to explore two-dimensional physics. Uh, a 2D optical lattice, on the other hand, um, you can see that it produces an array of one-dimensional tubes. And you can fill these one-dimensional tubes with fermions or bosons, and it's something that we've been very active in in, in our lab, is studying what happens in 1D and whether we can make a one-dimensional superconductor. And you can also do a three-dimensional optical lattice. So I'm showing here the simplest implementation, which is a simple cubic lattice. It looks kind of funny from here. I guess it's just smaller. I uh, hadn't noticed that before. All right. So this is like a, uh, like if you imagine taking a uh, box and putting in like an egg carton in this box in all three dimensions. Um, the atoms then form a crystal lattice, and they act as if they were, they're ions, crystal ions, that electrons can bind to. So you have a crystal lattice, not of an ionic lattice, but really a, a lattice of light. And so it's incredibly tunable and flexible and, and ultimately clean. All right, so these are the few methods that we use, and this is a very fast overview. We do laser cooling. So we use lasers as the first step of cooling the atoms. Doesn't quite get us to the quantum degenerate condition, but it's still, nonetheless, on an absolute temperature scale, it is extraordinary. So we're starting with you know, temperatures of 500, 600 Kelvin, and we reduce the temperature by many orders of, orders of magnitude down into the tens of, of micro Kelvin regime. To get to the quantum degenerate regime, however, we have to get colder, another order, another three orders of magnitude. And the way we do that is do evaporation. So imagine you have this coffee cup filled not with coffee, but with lithium atoms. And you, it won't taste very good. Uh, but you can use this as a way of illustrating how hot atoms escape, leaving the remaining behind the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of energies, the hot atoms escape, uh, leaving the rest of them to rethermalize at a lower temperature. So it's a very efficient way of extracting energy out of the system. We can then do atom trapping using uh, grabbing onto either a magnetic moment or an optical dipole moment. This happens to be uh, illustrating a magnetic trap. This was our very first magnetic trap, our very first BEC was done in, with permanent magnets. These were samarium cobalt um, magnets that produced a, a particular field configuration that trapped the atoms in three dimensions. So the trapping times were like minutes. And uh, then after you prepare the atoms, you cool them, you trap them, then you can do optical imaging by shining light on the atoms, they absorb some of this resonant light. The light is resonant with a near resonant with a transition in the atom. The atoms absorb some of the light and they cast a shadow that you can then put onto a camera and image. And so it's all very conceptually very, very simple. Uh, but if you go into some of the laboratories here, you can see the implementation is not so simple. Uh, and in fact, um, this is kind of what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the advisor's perspective of <laughs> the experiment, and this is reality. <laughs> so we don't have a permanent magnet trap anymore. These are electromagnetic, uh, these are uh, connections for bringing in hundreds of amps of current to make an electromagnetic trap. 
Um, and then there's somewhere buried in all of this, you can barely see it, there's a tube, which is called a Zaman slower. And we use that to use, combined with laser cooling, to slow the atoms down out of a, a hot thermal oven. And the atoms slow down, they enter in this ultra high vacuum chamber, and then we, uh, we image them. And as I promised, it's just a microscope, nothing more than that. And so we shine light up into this microscope and take pictures on uh, a CCD camera. All right, this is uh, one of the first things that we did when we made a degenerate Fermi gas. So this goes back to 2001, done by Andrew Truscott and Kevin Strecker. Um, and what I'm showing here is co-trapping of lithium-7 and lithium-6. And as I promised, at high temperatures, they're essentially indistinguishable. At high temperatures, it doesn't really matter if we're talking about lithium-7 or lithium-6. And high temperature, the definition of high temperature is a temperature which is relative to the Fermi energy is, is high. And so this happens to be a temperature equal to the Fermi temperature, about 800 nanokelvin. On the right is lithium-6, which is a Fermi gas. And the left is lithium-7, which is a Bose gas. And we take pictures of one and then the other, but they're actually superimposed on top of one another and they're interacting. They're thermalized, they're at the same temperature. So if you look at that, you say, okay, they're pretty much the same. There's, what's, you know, what's the deal between bosons and fermions? Well, if you get colder, this is now about a half of the Fermi temperature, you start to see that the fermions are requiring a little bit more space than are the bosons. The bosons are more compact spatially. So these are in situ images. These are images of atoms in a harmonic bowl, if you want, a trap for the atoms. And if I go a little colder, then it's really obvious. So now I'm at a quarter of the Fermi temperature. I really am quantum degenerate. And it's clear that the fermions require more space than the bosons do. And even though they're roughly the same number of atoms and they're both essentially uh, weakly interacting, um, the fermions are distinctly different. This is a manifestation, of course, of Fermi pressure. So if I plot the size of the atom cloud on the vertical axis, the atom cloud in the trap, versus temperature on this axis, I get this data, which is shown by the yellow points, which is distinctly different than the classical <coughs> Maxwell-Boltzmann prediction, shown here by this green line. And that difference is telling us that even at zero temperature, there's still finite energy in the system. This is what Fermi realized in 1925, that you cool a gas of electrons or neutrons to zero temperature, there's still residual energy in the system. And that residual energy actually produces a pressure and it stabilizes white dwarf and neutron stars against gravitational collapse. This is exactly the same physics. Somewhat different length scale and somewhat different energy scale, but exactly the same physics. All right, so that's my introduction. Are there any questions so far? Okay, oh, we have a question. The French, the, the, the interference that you see in all the images. Yeah. Why, you, why you see them in bosons and fermions at all temperatures? The images that you showed before? Yes. You see fringes everywhere. So what? I would expect only maybe in the boson in the coolest temperature. Ah. Here. Yeah. So these are, these are lithium-7 atoms and these are lithium-6 atoms and we can separately image them. Mm -hmm. They have different transition frequencies. And so we know they're imaging lithium-7, we know we're imaging lithium-6. And so everything is on the left is lithium-7, everything on the right is lithium-6. And what the images show is that there's a gradual change, that the energy, the average energy per particle of a Fermi gas at this temperature is not very different th than at this temperature. Whereas in, for bosons, it's considerably different. The energy here is considerably different. The energy, in fact, is proportional to this radius squared. So we're in a harmonic potential and the energy is harmonically related to its size. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
All right, so this is now a discussion of the BEC-BCS crossover. So this is the, really the first main physics result that came out of cooling uh, fermions to ultra-low quantum degenerate temperatures. So what I'm showing over here on the left are up fermions and down fermions, essentially spin a half fermions. They're a model of an electron. So an electron's a spin a half fermion. And if they weakly interact, they can form a many body pair. So we know that from Cooper pairing and superconductivity. So this is essentially a model of superconductivity and the Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer limit. If I start cranking up the interaction between upspins and downspins, they become, they become bound together. The pair size gets smaller and smaller until eventually the pairs become so small, they're composite bosons. Because now I've taken two fermions, stuck them together, and now they're composite bosons. And those composite bosons can form a Bose-Einstein condensation. And so this is superfluidity of, say, helium-4. This is bosonic superfluidity. And this is fermionic superfluidity. And the, the, the wonderful thing about the BEC-BCS crossover, it really, I think, illustrated this point very well that there's little, little difference, there's no difference in the order parameter between a BCS-like superconductor and liquid helium-4, which is a BEC superfluid. It's only the strength of the order parameter that vary, not the qualitative uh, characteristics of that order parameter. So how do we do this? So how do we go from weak interaction to strong interaction? Well, we can use something that looks like this. So imagine you have a two-body interaction potential, which is a square well. And it has some depth u naught that you can adjust. So this is the distance between atoms, some distance r. And I have some well that I can adjust. So initially, this well is, let's say, very weak. And if I plot the S-wave scattering length, which is a measure of the interaction as, get, as given by this equation, this is the interaction in mean field, if I start out with an attraction which is very weak, the S-wave scattering length is zero. But as I increase the depth of the well, that corresponds to having a stronger and stronger interaction between these atoms, or electrons, if you will. And eventually, there's a bound state that forms. And that bound state is called the unitarity limit, because at this point, the scattering cross-section actually diverges because of this resonance with this bound state. So this is all, you know, this is all junior level uh, quantum mechanics that Eduardo said that he just learned about from uh, Cohen Tanuji in the last couple of years. Um, so this comes from that. This comes from Cohen Tanuji's book. And if you go deeper still, these bound states become more and more tightly bound and they become composite bosons. And so you map out something that looks like this. There's a resonance. This is the Feshbach resonance. And as you go away from the resonance, the scattering length gets small again when this bound state is far from the uh, uh, continuum. So this is schematic. So this doesn't tell us exactly how the Feshbach resonance is implemented, but it gives you the idea of what it does. So it turns out that there are really two potentials involved. There's a triplet and a singlet potential for the experts in the audience. And they can, be, they can be tuned separately by a magnetic field. And so a magnetic field can tune the triplet level, but the singlet level has no magnetic moment. And so this depth of this effective well um, does exactly what I've illustrated here in this cartoon. So that's a schematic of a Feshbach resonance. And this is a schematic of the B, BEC to BCS crossover. All right, so to be a little bit more concrete, um, these, are the t these are the Zeeman sublevels. This is magnetic field, this is energy. Magnetic sublevels of the lithium-6 atom. And we use these two lowest going ones. We trap them op optically. Um, and we call them spin up and spin down, respectively. 
Now they're not really spin up and spin down, they simply differ in projection of nuclear spin, um, but figuratively they form a spin a half system um, with this one we just designate as being the spin up particle and this one the spin down. So it's the same electronic spin, but it's a different nuclear spin projection. So this is a measurement that we did in my lab, um, I guess about 10 years ago now, um, which is on the local pair correlations, something related to the contact. So the contact is the, the uh, density density correlation function, which is shown here in operator form. And the contact was um, an idea invented by somebody named Sheena Tan at Georgia Tech. And he realized that this quantity uh, can, be, can explain much of the micros microscopic and macroscopic physics of these strongly interacting Fermi gases. So what we're showing here is essentially the contact as a function of magnetic field. So this is where the Feshbach resonance occurs, about 830 Gauss, right there. And over in here is the BEC limit, a very low fields. This is, corresponds to here. And the BCS limit, this one, is over in here. And this is two-body physics. It's exact because we can do two-body physics exactly. And you can see the data, the red points, fit two-body physics very well. But on the BCS side, this is all many-body physics, and you have to do a much more sophisticated theory. Um, but people have, and they uh, confirm that this is a measure of this uh, contact parameter um, in the BCS regime. All right, so another thing that we've done a little bit more recently, I guess this is a paper published last year, is to measure the equation of state in the BEC-BCS crossover. And what we measured effectively was the energy per particle, um, or actually this is the total energy, divided by the energy of a free Fermi gas. This is the energy of an ideal Fermi gas. So this is actually, that equation appears in Fermi's uh, 2000 and, or <laughs> Fermi's 1925 paper. Fermi didn't come back from the dead. Uh, in 1925, uh, he had this expression. We just divide that to normalize it. And so you can see in the BCS side, uh, we're approaching the energy of a free Fermi gas. But on the BEC side, because the, these uh, molecules are so tightly bound um, in forming this Bose-Einstein condensate, the chemical potential is getting smaller and smaller and um, the, uh, the, the total energy of the system is becoming less. So this is a comparison with theory. The theory is in green, and the measurements, our measurements, are in the purple and the blue, and there's a measurement by Wolfgang Ketterle's group, which is right about there at Unitarity, and it's all in pretty good shape. All right, so that is my discussion of the BEC-BCS crossover. Any questions at this point? Yes? Could you um, uh, talk a little bit more about the factor Z? The yes, uh, okay. So to be more specific, this factor is the closed channel fraction of the Feshbach resonance. So we have a Feshbach resonance which is open channel dominated and so um, the open channel is the triplet channel, the closed channel is the singlet. So in this case, it's telling us how much of that bound state, that bound molecular state, is entering the many body wave function. And so you can see when you get um, far on the BEC side, it's that closed channel is starting to make a difference, like 10%. But on the BCS side, it's like a part per million. And so there's very little closed channel fraction um, in the BCS limit. And this was something that uh, Yvon Castin uh, pointed out in, at ENS uh, um, was why it was related, in fact, to the contact. Yeah, so this, the way we measured that quantity was to do molecular spectroscopy. So we uh, tuned a laser uh, between the pairs that are in, you know, in the trap forming this superfluid 
um, and projected them onto a molecule who is very tightly bound. So the molecule size here is only about 10 angstroms, whereas the pair size is of order, you know, microns. And so by projecting this pair onto this molecular state, you can measure the rate of that excitation and get an idea of then what this correlation function is. Okay, any others? Yes, Manuel. True. Okay. Yeah. Accept that. So that, um, yeah. So, and in, in this is a 3D experiment, and I would certainly say that those bosons are condensed in this case. But I see your point in 1D, you might not want to make that distinction. Okay. So this is my last topic, which is antiferromagnetism in an optical lattice. This is a recent experiment that we've done in my lab. In fact, this is the experiment that was done by Pedro Duarte um, uh, about a year and a half ago. So the Hubbard model is a very generic model in condensed matter physics and um, is given mathematically by these two terms. There's a kinetic energy term, which represents hopping from site to site. So it assumes a lattice, as I've shown here in one dimension. That's the hopping interaction, hopping or tunneling from site to site. Um, and then an interaction term, which is supposed to be on site. And so atoms only interact if they're on top of each other. That's, that's a uh, parameter of the model. And so you can see here that energy difference, it's repulsive causes the energy to go up when the atoms, uh, when two atoms multiply occupy a site. So um, if there are more than one atom of the same spin on the site, it's not allowed by the Pauli principle um, because we're assuming only a single band. And that's the entire model. That's it. It turns out to be an extraordinarily rich model of, of solid state physics. It goes back about 40 years to try to explain some, an aspect of transition metal oxides. But in 1986, Phil Anderson proposed this model as a minimal model of high TC superconductivity. And to this day, I don't think Manuel would be able to know better than I, but uh, to this day, I don't know if we understand whether or not that statement's true. Whether or not this model contains the essence of superconductivity. Is with negative U, isn't it? I'm sorry. The simple model is with negative U. Um, no, the the model that uh, that <coughs> Phil Anderson is considering was a repulsive U model. The slave boson? Um, no, it was the um, uh, resonance valence bond kind of a model. So, um, so the idea is is that once you generate holes, if you dope this, so we'll get to this in a minute, but. For the experts in the audience, we'll make a mod insulator and then you can dope it. So then you have holes that can move. And so that's supposed to be the origin of, of, of superconductivity. So this is really what's motivating us. So this idea, that question is something that we would like to, in the cold atom community, to be able to say something about. We have this beautiful new platform for doing many body physics and we should be able to answer some of these fundamental questions. So it is a paradigm model of strongly correlated matter. It's unsolvable because the basis size is scaling exponentially with the number of particles. And so even though it's a very simple model with just these two terms, the physics that it contains is extraordinarily rich and um, complicated. And there are no exact solutions and there are no numerical solutions to the Hubbard model with any reasonable sized lattice at low temperature. And so this opens up an opportunity for us uh, to be able to make essentially an analog quantum computer to realize the phases of the, of the Hubbard model that can't be computed in any other way and can't be determined in any other experimental way as well. 
So this is the, what's motivating us. This is a phase diagram of a generic high TC material. This happens to be a cuprate superconductor. There's temperature on this axis and hole doping on this axis. So for us, hole doping means that we're adding, uh, we're removing particles from the system so that there are more holes in the lattice, more vacancies in the lattice. Now at uh, an undoped lattice where we have exactly one particle per site, um, this model of, uh, or this phase diagram of cuprate superconductivity says there's this region of antiferromagnetism, um, which is also turned out to be a mod insulator that I'll discuss in a moment. That transition temperature, the nail transition into this antiferromagnet occurs above room temperature. But you have to remember, so it seems like it's a high temperature phenomena, but you have to remember that all temperatures are relevant to the Fermi temperature. And so whereas in these materials, there's a Fermi temperature of 10,000 degrees Kelvin, we have a Fermi temperature of a micro Kelvin. So we have 10 orders of magnitude to make up. So 300 Kelvin becomes 30 nano Kelvin. And that becomes really difficult to get to experimentally. So uh, as you dope it, presumably there's this dome of D-wave superconductivity, but that remains to be proven. So right now we're studying this phase of matter, this antiferromagnet. So it turns out that there's a special case that when there's exactly one atom per site, the Hubbard model becomes analogous to the Heisenberg antiferromagnetic model. J here is positive and is equal to something called a super exchange term, which is the hopping squared over U. And these are uh, spin operators. And so um, this Hamiltonian gives rise for strong enough U, strong enough repulsive interaction to an insulating phase, a mod insulator where there's an interaction driven transition to just a single atom per site. So the energy cost of having two atoms occupy a single site is so high that they prefer not to do that. And so at some value of, of, uh, of U, there's a quantum phase transition into this uh, mod insulator. And that's been seen with cold atoms about, uh, well, about eight years ago now, uh, both at ETH uh, and in Munich um, and uh, using slightly different methods. But what hasn't been seen is the transition below the nail transition, which the nail transition is related to this energy scale, this T squared over U, um, which happens when the entropy per particle becomes less than or order or the order of log two. And that's the spin entropy. So at relatively high temperatures, we can freeze out our, all the charge entropy by making a mod insulator. And what's left, so what's left is a random ordering of spins. But if you go to even lower temperatures below this criterion, the spins line up in a checkerboard-like fashion, up, down, up, down, up, down, and that's the antiferromagnet. And that's not been seen before. So this is, a little, this pre presents a challenge to us to be able to achieve temperatures that are low enough to be able to go below this nail transition. This is a challenge to our community. We're very proud of being able to have the lowest temperatures of, of anything in the universe, right? So we, there's nothing out there that's colder than 10 nanokelvin. But we need to get to even lower temperatures to be able to see these transitions. And so the question is, how, how do we do that? How can we get to even lower uh, temperatures um, in, in a lattice? So this is uh, a quantum Monte Carlo result showing temperature on this axis and uh, interaction on this axis. This is a uh, phase diagram of the antiferromagnetism. And it shows us for a, a trapped gas that the entropy indeed has to be less than log two, which is about roughly 0.7, in order to enter this antiferromagnetic regime with U over T of about eight. And if you go below that, then you can get 
deeply into the Nail regime. And so far, all the temperatures that have been previously reported by other groups are up in here, up in this range, about a factor of two above the Nail transition. So how do we get colder? So in a trap, one thing I didn't really discuss with you earlier was that we can adjust the filling of this trap, essentially the chemical potential, relative to the evaporation edge. So atoms will evaporate out of this trap. They're sitting up here. They're filled up to this level mu. And atoms with enough energy will escape. And that will cause evaporative cooling. That works really well to get to very low entropies and very low temperatures in a trap, but it doesn't work so well in a lattice. And this is why. So in a lattice, I have not only this confining envelope, which is the laser beam, this is the shape of the laser beam, um, but I also have this corrugation. I also have this eggshell-like potential pattern, this periodic uh, potential, um, which causes the atoms, mu, to sit way down in here. And the chemical potential, the Boltzmann factor here, is so small, there is very little probability of atoms escaping and evaporative cooling just doesn't work in a lattice. So what can we do about that? Well, so this is the way an optical lattice is constructed. We have um, infrared laser beams that, as I mentioned to you, are, are retroreflected upon each other. This is a standing wave in, say, the x direction. That's a standing wave in the y direction. And that's a standing wave in the z direction. So how can we modify this geometry to be able to realize something more like that? So we came up with the idea of a compensated lattice. And the way it works is the following. So we take our optical lattice beams. These orange beams are the infrared lattice beams that are retroreflected on each other. Um, and we superimpose on each one of them a blue detune beam. And it turns out that the infrared is, whereas the infrared is attractive, the blue detune light, in this case 532 nanometers, is repulsive. And so you can offset this confining potential and make it look more like this. So I'm taking this, this is produced by the infrared beams, I'm superimposing on top of that this blue detune laser beam, and that gives me a knob, an adjustable parameter where I can adjust the chemical potential to be anything I want, and I can encourage evaporation. So this beam is not retroreflected upon itself. This is a beam dump. And so this is not a lattice, but it's modifying the confining envelope of the existing lattice. Well, it turned out that worked. So on the left, um, I'm showing some images, some density uh, images, in situ densities of uh, atoms in the lattice for various interaction strengths. So the blue is U over T of about 15, the red about 11, and the black about 3. And as you recall before, we should enter the mod insulating regime with U over T of order 8 to 10, something like that. So if you do something called an Obel transform, you can actually recover the full three-dimensional density distribution. And you can see here now very clearly it's flat. So the density here in the center of the trap is about 1 per site. And um, whereas for the weak interaction, it grows to something greater than one and a half atoms per site. It's not enough repulsive interaction to make the mod insulator. So this is just showing us that we can make a very clean mod insulator with very low entropy. But how do we detect the spin ordering? So we're really after now the spin degree of freedom. So the way they do it in solid state physics is if you have a, a crystal and you like to see if it's antiferromagnetic, you scatter either x-rays or, uh, or neutrons off of that crystal in some way that's spin dependent and um, be able to measure the structure factor, something called the structure factor. So we're doing the same thing. So we take, in our case, we're not taking neutrons, but we're using light that uh, enters the sample at a particular angle relative to these symmetry planes 
and then is scattered at a particular angle that satisfies the Sprague condition. So this is called the reciprocal lattice vector. This is the wave vector of the incoming light, and this is the wave vector of the scattered light. And they add up like that, it's a coherent scattering process, and we can detect it with a camera that's at the right angle. But we also looked at the fuse scattering as a way of normalizing our signal. So this is at some arbitrary angle. It's not coherently scattered, but it gives us a way of, of checking that what we're seeing is really coherent scattered light. It's really Bragg scattering. And it's spin sensitive because we can tune the Bragg scattering uh, laser beam to be in between the, what we're calling the upspins and the downspin atoms. All right, so it turns out that that Bragg scattering signal is directly related to something called the spin structure factor, which is a measure of how good your antiferromagnetic order is. Another way of saying that, it measures the correlation length of this magnet. And it turns out that that intensity of the scattered light is related to that uh, structure factor. We normalize it in the right way. And this, these are the results. So this is uh, the, the structure factor on this axis versus interaction on this axis. And as expected from the quantum Monte Carlo, um, we start seeing a signal uh, for U over T bigger than about six or seven and extending in kind of a broad plateau and then falling off again at even higher interaction strengths. And so this is indicative of antiferromagnetic order. This is the other direction. And it's actually a signal which is less than one, um, which is because of double occupancies. Double occupancies, I can explain, it's a little subtle, but it's uh, the double occupancies actually scatter less light than um, they would outside of a lattice. Now, if we compare that to the quantum Monte Carlo, and here's where the theorists earn their keep. This is where the theorists, this was a mammoth effort for them uh, and this was a mammoth effort for us uh, to calculate these uh, spin structure factors for various temperatures. So the temperature scales are given over here. This is in units of, of T, of hopping. That's 1.6, about 1, 0.6, 0 0.5, etc. And you can see how quickly the signal is starting to jump up. Um, as you approach the nail transition. So it turns out the nail transition is at 0.37. So it would be a structure factor which would be you know, way, way above this one. And what we're seeing is the onset of short range magnetic order that occurs above the nail transition temperature, um, but nonetheless is easily uh, detectable by this sensitive technique. So the best temperature fit, turns out this is a great thermometer um, the best temperature fit is this green line fit to the data, which gives us something about 40% above the nail transition. So we're about a factor of two colder than what anybody has done before in the lattice, but we still need to go lower. We still need it like another factor of two. And if we want to do some other uh, physics having to do with uh, topological phases of matter, for example, we need to be able to achieve these kinds of temperatures. So we're working on that. We have some ideas uh, working with theorists at Rice and elsewhere on how to redistribute entropy in the gas from the center of the cloud where we care about it to the edges where we don't care and, um, and then to shape the potential to get better evaporative cooling. All right, so I think I've, I've finished my time. Um, I have a very brief summary. Um, I hope that it, you've been convinced that ultra-cold atoms are really a, an emerging new platform for doing many-body physics that really was the purview of condensed matter physics before. Now we're doing something which is a completely different kind of system. We have different capabilities, but we also have different challenges and different limitations. So um, I didn't have time to talk about spin imbalance Fermi gases, but if you're interested, that's on our website. Uh, I did talk about antiferromagnetism in the Hubbard model and the thermometry that we were able to uh, demonstrate using quantum Monte Carlo. 
Now, one thing I'd like to point out is that this is the limit of the quantum Monte Carlo. They can't go any colder than this. It took them months to do the calculation that I showed, and that's really the limit of the technique for the size of the lattice that we have, which for me, I, I like that because that means that we're now entering new physics. Everything we see beyond this, the theorists can't follow, and that's, and that's great. <laughs> Experimentalists should be leading the way. So uh, we've done cooling in the optical lattice, and we're able to get to within 40% of the nail transition. Uh, we want to get to lower temperatures and coupled more directly to spin degree of freedom, and uh, we need more and better ideas to do that. Maybe some of you will come up with some great idea on how to get um, the spin degree of freedom even colder. Um, but what I would say is that the work thus far has opened up new avenues for exploring new novel states of matter, and uh, there's more to be learned, much more to be learned. All right, so let me acknowledge the people who did the work. Uh, the primary experimentalists were Pedro Duarte, um, who I mentioned is Colombian, is from Bogota, uh, and Russ Hart, uh, but also Zin Zeng Liu and, and Ernie Young. And uh, we had a, enjoyed a great collaboration with David Hughes, Nandini Trivedi, uh, Richard Scolitar, Teresa Paiva, who's uh, in Rio, she's a Brazilian, and Asan Katami. So thank you very much. Does anyone has a question? No. Yeah, so my question I mean, it comes also a little bit from reading your papers. I mean, you mentioned that uh, this experiment, one of your final goals is to study high TC uh, superconductivity. Yeah, and of course, this is one of the most important pro open problems in condensed matter. But something that it is known about this is that the, the system is layered. I mean, it, the 2D physics is very important. So I was wondering how will you uh, put the 2D physics here? Yeah, great question. So, um, come back to here. No, I don't want to update your operating system, Mr. Gates. <laughs> Go away. So, um, in the optical lattice, uh, in the optical lattice, um, we can um, change the strength of one lattice direction relative to the others. And so by making the lattice very uh, strong in one of the three dimensions, you've essentially made an isolated uh, planes of, two, of a 2D system, isolated 2D planes. Now we may, if we want to do Bragg scattering on that, um, each plane is going to be different, uh, essentially phase, than the, other, than the other plane below it. And so that's problematic. And so you, you may want to make an apparatus where you have a single plane. And especially for some ideas I'm making, you know, chiral P-wave superfluids that are showing non-abelian statistics and things like this, you want to have, you want to have single, you know, two-dimensional planes, maybe a bilayer kind of a system. So that remains, that remains to be done. So other labs are doing things like that. Okay, but are you planning to also do yeah, so, so for us, to get to something which is more 2D layered system, it's just a knob. You know, we have to, we just tune that. But um, where it really matters, so the anti-paramagnetism um, is, is also visible in three dimensions. Uh, but where it really matters is to be able to see the D-wave pairing, and it probably we want, want to have a, a 2D system, maybe weekly couple, couple planes. And there we have to um, also dope the system. So we have to figure out how to way to change the density okay. in an inhomogeneous gas. So this is, this is why we're interested in SLMs, for example. Okay. Another question? Uh, no. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that something you need to, in order to cool. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. You mentioned that something that you needed to do to cool uh, down more uh, the 
the atoms was to redistribute uh, the entropy. Yes. But, but how do you do that? It's just, I how do we reduce the entropy? Yeah, because yes. for me it was something very theoretical and now it seems yeah. it's something you can control so in the laboratory. Yeah. So how do you what? How do you redistribute the entropy? Ah, how do you redistribute the, it? Yeah. Ah, okay. Ah, so we have an idea for that. <laughs> Let me show you this. I'm really excited about this. Let me uh, get back. Like many of you, I have gazillions of slides on my files. All right, so. This is our idea. Um, we even have a name for it. <laughs> so this is actually in collaboration with uh, Caden Hazard, who's a theorist at Rice, and Richard Scolitar. And the idea is, is that if you have a, a system which is a mod insulator in the center, so uh, you have exactly one atom per site in some kind of a mod core. So imagine you have an apple and the core is this solid uh, one atom per site mott phase. And around that, you have something with density which is less than one. And in fact, this is the edges of the trap and the density goes from one in this red region to uh, eventually to zero at the edge of this shell. And so that's a metal actually. So that actually can conduct. So um, particles, you can have particle transport through the metal, but where you can't be in the MOT phase. The MOT phase is insulating. And so we began to think about, well, maybe the reason we're not effectively, so we're cooling the edges very effectively because we do evaporative cooling in the edges. Maybe we're not able to cool the MOT phase very well because we're not able to get transport through the insulator to the edges where it's evaporated. So the idea is to provide a, a freeway, a pathway for uh, the um, atoms in this mott core to go out to the edges of the sample. And so what this is is a laser beam. It's blue detuned. It's, it's like, imagine a rod, which is excluding some of the atoms. And so now in, inside this rod, instead of having one atom per site on average, you have maybe a half an atom per site. And so now it's conducting. Now it's a metal. And the metal, moreover, not only can it conduct the entropy out to the edges, but it can also store entropy. It turns out that the metal soaks up entropy and its charge degree of freedom that the, that the insulator cannot. And so this is, uh, we have high hopes for this, and this is another reason why we're using something called a, a digital micro mirror device. Um, to try to make a, uh, these entropy conduits. Another question? Perhaps it, it's a silly question, but you started with, with the high TC phase di diagram, and I don't see how, how in your experiment can you go uh, from an antiferromagnetic phase to a superfluid phase by doping. Uh, okay. Think. So um, remember that the, that the phase diagram is not the phase diagram of the Hubbard model. So it's a phase diagram of ITC material. And so we don't know, we don't know whether or not there is, in fact, uh, ITC or uh, superconductivity in the Hubbard model. But let me, let me explain the nature of the experiment. Okay. Yes. So, um, so what we have here is a phase diagram of a, of a cuprate material. And let's say for uh, argument that it is actually representative of the, of the Hubbard model. Let's say the Hubbard model actually has this superconducting region in it. Well, in order to access that, one needs to dope the mod insulator. And so there's not one atom per site, but in this case, 0.9 to 0.8 atoms per site and um, achieve a low enough temperature. 
um, and then uh, be able to detect some signature of superfluidity and probably need to do it in a two-dimensional system, as, as Jorge has mentioned. Did that answer, answer your question? Not really. As far as I know, there is a, a superfluid phase in, in over modern. I, and you are, you are sure know that there is also an antiferromagnetic phase yes. in modern. I, I don't see the connection. Yes, there are two different regions of the phase diagram. So it's the same material, but under different conditions. So, one of, so under the condition of zero doping, you see an antiferromagnet. In, uh, in the condition of moderate hole doping, you see a superconductor. And so it's known that in all of these high TC materials, almost all of them are also antiferromagnets at small doping. And so this is the connection. So this is, you know, Anderson realized that that, you know, that this uh, antiferromagnetism magnetic phase is very reminiscent of the uh, cuprate superconductors. One last question? Well, I have one. Uh, <laughs> uh, how did you do thermometry bef in an optical lattice before the method you presented? Oh, that was back in the old, very uh, antique days. Um, we would only, the only way we could do thermometry was to um, turn the lattice off slowly, we hoped adiabatically, measure the temperature in the trap, and then turn the lattice back on again and see, you know, and do that a couple of times, see that it doesn't change. It doesn't work very well. And, it, and naturally, the, you know, as you turn the lattice on or off, you heat things up. And so we never got a good measure. We could only put a lower limit. We could say the temperature or an upper limit. We could say that the temperature was no greater than a certain amount. And that limit was not very, very uh, useful. Okay, so well, let's thank our speaker. And we'll, we'll meet ourselves. Thank you.